entertainment group. He's an Academy Award and Emmy Award winning New York City based entertainment company. He is not that with his company. Hunt leads the company's studio division, developing and producing high profile content for digital video and podcasts, TV, and film. Please welcome to the stage our friend Brian Hunt. that box of tricks. Yeah. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody's here. It's so cool. It's like um, my, a lot of my family are here. They, they're, they're looking away. <laughs> um, but it's uh, so nice. And, and Matt O'Stryker, oh, Stry oh, I love his name. It's like a superhero. It's like a Marvel character. <laughs> So we, we have to interrupt you for one second. Oh, last one. We just want to thank you so much for doing this. So we, first of all, have just a poster commemorating the event tonight. We all signed for you. Aww. And, and then the one thing we do here is we have these seat tags that need to honor donors and our special friends here in the back of the seats. You see these. So if you can read the names on B21 and 22 for us. We'd love to hear what those seat tags say. Um, but anyway, it's actually really cool. 
And I thought, in case you get bored, because it's, it's like Warren Bryan, I'm going to spin out. And you're like, oh, God. And so I'm, I'm hoping that if you wanted to take a picture of this, I did bring the dancing hamburger. <laughs> this thing has survived. I don't know how, but like, for, it's been over 40 years for this thing. And it was actually made from Jimmy Picker, the, the animator. Um, he, he actually like, made a burger, and he like, put some spray on it and stuff. And of course, mice got at it. And so now there's like, there's no lettuce and no tomatoes. But there is uh, still some of this stuff. And it's pretty cool. And if, and if anybody wanted to take a picture with it, it's, it's not going to be alive next year, I don't think. And I'm, I'm going to let you figure out yeah. right, how, to, how to do this because it's really delicate. Um, and here's a box. <laughs> you can go ahead and bring that. Um, so, uh, Brent, I'm sorry about that. No, sorry. Yeah, no. Yeah. You, you asked me to set that up, and I was like, there's no way I'm, I'm touching that. I'm, uh, <laughs> and this is for you. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. It's really so, so cool to see the movie theater here. Oh, wow. uh, so, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot I want to talk about, and I, I'm, 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 we're going to get to questions. I, just watching the movie, it's clear that there are, uh, how beloved this is to everybody out here as well. I'm sure there's questions, and so we're gonna, uh, I wanna kinda start at the beginning though. Well, first I just wanna say, did you, when you were making this, did you have any thought in your head like, oh, in 40 years, <laughs> we'll still be playing this in theaters and I'll be on the stage talking about it? Did you have any sense at all that you were making something that was going to be, uh, that was going to live on? Well, um, yeah. I have to admit that, that when I was making it, it was really funny and the dailies were funny and stuff. I was like, oh, this might really be cool. And then when it bombed on the weekend, I was like, you know what? I'll never see this movie ever again. And um, the thing, as I was explaining to young Brian, is that like back then, if you didn't make your money on the weekend, like that Friday night, the studio would call you up and they would you know, basically call you an idiot. And so um, that happened to me like twice, like one crazy summer too. It's like, um, so I had no friends on Monday, but um, then there was the advent of video and HBO and all that and lived on. And it's like so amazing because I really thought I was going to be shoveling poop for I mean, Sort of do that on the weekend just for fun, but that's something else. Um, but uh, so it's it just amazing that I am here with you guys, and it's really fun. It's really so neat to watch and watch the reaction and see squid. <laughs> so I want to start at the beginning of this because uh, so you're you're 24, you have no film or television credits, right? And you have a, uh, a movie idea, a, a suicide comedy with singing hamburgers. <laughs> And you call Warner Brothers up, and they're like, yeah, man, here's three million. How, how did you get this movie made, and did they let you direct it? Well, it's a really, the thing is, that's a, a really long story, but it was a series of things that went really well for me. And I think one of the mo most important things are, like, the people like Animal House came out. There's all these movies, even Porky's, I would say, um, that came out, and they were teen-oriented, and they were very cheap. So studios were making giant movies back then. Uh, just saw with like, you know, Fast Times and stuff were coming out and doing really well. And so I just happened to have a teeny movie thing right when everybody was saying, hey, anybody got a teeny movie thing, uh, script? And I did. And my dad dancing hammers and people committing suicide. But no, it was, uh, it was just perfect timing. That's did, all. did you get notes on, on the script? Were you, were, I, I mean, so, so I've, I've dealt, I, I deal with this, like, I can't imagine the notes. And the, and the annoying uh, people who wouldn't get it. Yeah, I have to admit something. There were no notes. Wow. It was kind of mad. It, it was, <laughs> <laughs> but believe me, after that, I realized everybody thought they had to, you know, that I screwed up. So they were like, well, let me give you some notes now for the next one. So, um, but it was an amazing experience because of um, this guy, Andy Meyer, and uh, Michael Jaffe that took a chance on me. And um, they sold me to this company. Um, that was distributed by Warner Brothers. And they were so not sure what the heck this thing was, because it was so weird, and as I was just telling you, even the name, Better Off Dead, like they didn't want to, they, they just fought me every day about that. I just wanted it to be kind of an iconic, like, what is this movie, you know? And um, in the end, um, nobody wanted to show up on the set and say that they knew what they were talking about, because nobody really understood the movie. If you watch it, you see why. You know? <laughs> I mean, I still watch it, I'm like, really, did I really do that? Wow. 
Um, how did you know how to direct? Were you just well, well, kind of I, rolling with them? You know, I, um, I went to Cal Arts, which is this film school in Los Angeles, and um, I did four years there, and I realized if I bought a keg, everybody would come and watch my movies. So, and it really worked, it was great. So um, I basically made a bunch of movies, so they have keg parties, basically. And so um, I really did learn, uh, like, for instance, um, there were some shorts I made before that, and that's, there's a lot of, there's so many layers to this, and we'll be here all night, but um, a lot of the actors that are in Better Off Dead Ed are from my short movies. And um, they, for the most part, like especially at CalArts, there was a f film department and an acting department, but they never got together. They never had the acting student people in the films. So I always had people that um, were like janitors or something like that that would come in and you know, play a part. And so, which is a whole other thing about like, learning my directing technique, because I just told people, go up there and be funny, okay? And, uh, <laughs> you know, and so some actors didn't like that. <laughs> they were a but your funny. cast looks like real people, though. Like you yeah. can see where that 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 inspiration from from doing it because they, they they all look like real people. Yeah, I'm so lucky. I mean, the cast is just amazing. And um, one thing that did happen was I made this movie. I, I don't know if anybody's heard the story. And I apologize if they've heard it a million times. But I had a birthday party when I was 11, and nobody came. And um, I stood for a drunk clown that tried to pick up my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I just remember watching the Flintstones with him going, all right, and I said, like, oh, just stop. And, and, and my sister's good to go out and ring the doorbell. They're here. And I'm like, well, they're not. <laughs> so, I mean, that is, that is, that is so, so anyway, it was actually supposed to be sad. So I saw my friend's club on. He said, oh, you're such a whiner. Like, what is it? Oh, like, it must be my birthday party. It made me sad. So he said, you should make that into a movie. So I made this really sad movie. And it opened at this film festival called Filmex in Los Angeles that started, uh, did anybody happen to see this movie called Eating Raul? Yeah. yeah. Well, it opened for that. So it was like the first night of the movie, of the, the Los Angeles, first time that they had a film festival. And my movie opened the film festival. Just pure luck. I mean, I submitted it and they loved it. And so um, it opened the film festival. And so the next day I had a lot of friends, which was good. <laughs> but one of the most important ones was Henry Winkler, the Fonz. And, yeah. and he loved it, and he was so sweet, and he said, do you have any other sad stories? And of course, I had my breakup story, and I was you know, just a whole whiny and broken heart. And, he, you know, he basically gave me an office to write it, and, and at Paramount. So I was like, you know, 23, driving a little sleepy motorcycle to The Paramount. coolest person in the world at the time. Exactly. And um, he, he helped me to write it, and he showed me, um, he was making a movie called um, Night Shift. With Ron and he would take me to dailies and show me how it's working, and I was like, I just couldn't believe how lucky I was. Again, pure luck, minimal talent, but lots of luck. <laughs> and so um, he's the one that uh, he, when I finished the script, he didn't want to make it, which was fine. Um, and then this, uh, he introduced me to this Andy Meyer at A and M Records that did want to make it, and he got me the financing through, through C. It's a whole other thing. And um, he introduced me to John Cusack because he had just done this sure thing with John Cusack. And once I met John, I was like, I hate, this guy is going to be ginormous, you know, he's fabulous. And I couldn't think of anything else, you know, any other person in it. And luckily, uh, I got John to be in it. And uh, it's, a, it's yeah. quite happy. Like, he's so good at it. I mean, it's just so adorable. It's, it's, like, it's my favorite thing he's ever done. I just love it. He's <laughs> so <laughs> We'll, let's, we'll come back to Cusack because I want to talk about sure. a lot of the cast, um, which is they're, and they're so great and unique. Um, I, I was trying to figure out where like your where the kind of uh, influences and inspirations that came to it because it there's something really unique about your film to me is that it's um, and we were talking about this a little bit. It's 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 kind of a satire of, of teen movies, um, but but the teen movies are just becoming huge at the time. So you know you have like the Zucker brothers are doing uh, Airplane and and then Mel Brooks stuff. They're seeing some of that, but those are kind of sp spoofs, right? And there's a little t there's a little like anti comedy um, like a, like the Jerk and Steve Martin, but it it felt very unique to me, and I was wondering like what. What were you loving going into it, and, and do you feel like any of that kind of spilled out into your movie? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff, one thing that was, my dad is the lawyer, and I did some David Ogden Stiers, and my 
dad's lawyer, and he's pretty, cr cr pretty crappy. He was pretty crappy back then. Um, and so the one thing he would do, though, he would take me to movies, which was awesome. And one thing he loved was Woody Allen, which I didn't really understand. But uh, what, when the old Woody Allen movies had just slapstick, stupid comedy. I mean, just out of nowhere, these weird things would happen. And they were really funny, and it made my dad laugh. And like, I think I told my sister once, I don't think I ever saw my dad's teeth, because he never laughed. So. Um, <laughs> It, that was very inspirational to me, and Mel Brooks, and I was doing, I think, Blazing Saddles came out, so there were some irreverent kind of comedies that, that I really liked, and I saw the audience really liking them. Um, and then, um, when I got to college, I saw, um, oh gosh, um, I saw, oh, you'll know what it is, it's, uh, oh, Harold and Maude, did anybody oh, ever yeah. see Harold and Maude? Oh, okay, so, so there was that darkness to it that sort of, like, said, boy, it, it kind of gave me permission to do a little bit, you know, it's a, this is obviously the only other suicide. Comedy. Exactly. And I, was like, oh, you know, I guess this can be done. Yeah. And um, so that was some really big references for me to uh, steal. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, because you're 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 playing with like the teen movie tropes and you're mm -hmm. subverting them at the same time. Like the the scene I love is the uh, the classroom scene, right? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah the map, the map, perfect, yeah. right? There, everybody is. And if you look, like Ferris Bueller comes out a year later, and they have the classroom scene where, you know, it's funny too, but it's the Bueller, no one's into it. Right. Same thing They're happens drooling. fast times, right? But you took it and they flipped, love math. Yeah, yeah. flipped the whole thing. Yeah, yeah and, and I was sort of telling Brian earlier, it's like with the, in all the early teen movies, there's always the guy who's just the stoner guy, you know, and again, this drug, so I thought, well, Curtis did just, Curtis, I just wanted him to be, do, say inappropriate things that he thought were correct. And then, um, you know, I think he's doing drugs, but since it wasn't real drugs, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, and then, you know, there was other things. Some notes I did get, I have to admit, like, I was going to bring up. One thing that always troubles me is you always kind of had a, like, have a sex scene, and they wanted the, the F-bomb dropped at least once to make it um, a PG-13 or R or something like that. I just couldn't do it, and it was, um, I, they got mad at me about that. Um, but... Oh gosh, <laughs> I broke everything. Um, so there were some of those things in there, like like that's why I had, um, you know, um, I'm sorry, uh, Amanda and, and John, like they're they're making out in the park, and I, instead of doing a sex scene, I just made the storm tires off their car. Right, semi, you know, um, it wasn't exactly what we wanted, but <laughs> but that that was the thing. I was just poking fun at some of that stuff, but. For the most part, I have to admit, a lot of it was trying to get as much stuff in the movie as possible that um, if I fail, like I could say, but look, I did cartoons in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and actually, you, know, you brought this up, and I, I have kind of an interesting story. It's about the Van Halen hamburger thing. You ready for this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, in the original script, I had a thing where John was working at Pig Burgers, Lane, sorry, Lane was working at Pig Burgers, and he, um, they, they had, this is an urban legend that this rat, you know, falls into the vat of fried stuff. So I had that in the script, and it's something that already bothered, like, Andy Meyer and the producers and stuff. And I thought it was kind of gross. And I was like, well, I wrote it, so it must be important. And then um, he finally talked me out. He said, it's gross, it's not funny. And I, I realized he was, oh, because the whole point is that, like, didn't you see a lady, like, a smith or something, ate the rat, and he thought it was a murder, and it was really gross. So he's like, I found something else. And so I was just driving home, and Van Halen had just released whatever, Everybody wants from everybody wants somebody to on, and I realized I, I had never done like a musical. So I, and I'm like, how could I show these a musical? In <laughs> <laughs> and I and I just watched this show about like Busby Berkeley and stuff, which was this old like, guy that would do these giant extravagant things. I'm like, well, I don't have that kind of money, but I can do French fries. <laughs> and so um, that's oh exactly what I did. So I, I was and right then I, I, that song, everybody wants them, everybody wants some comes on. And I was like, that's a song. And so I brought it to Andy the next day, and he was like, it's better than a rat that's being like, oh. I mean, he didn't get it at all, and I wasn't sure I was right either, but it seemed like a pretty cool idea. And the bottom line of this long more story is that when we tested the movie, it was the highest rated yep. thing in the movie testing. <laughs> and the warriors were like, you gotta cut off that stupid hamburger thing, it's so dumb, and you know, and, and the Van Halen guy said, sure, go ahead, not thinking they would ever make the movie. And um, like I said, it was the highest rated thing in the test screen. Did you ever hear like any feedback like the you know Daily Rock or any of these guys like? No, that that was a. It, I had um, Alex 
Alex Van Halen came to watch something. Oh, I know what it was. You know what I was trying to do? I was trying to get them to do a theme song for One Year's in Summer. And then I showed him what I did in the first one, and then he walked out. <laughs> <laughs> that never happened. But it was fun to have Alex Van Halen away from my movie. And yeah, that's cool. cool. They were a little unfocused in 85. They were. They were <laughs> great. They were it up, and they were really hard to find it. The thing was that I, I was so committed to that song. That's the other thing that we had to track down. They had just broken up. And like David Lee Roth was like in South America or something, and, and, and he was here. And they, but they wouldn't. They had to talk to each other and say they all had to say yes. So there was like a super panic because we just went for it and made it anyway, just hoping that they would say yes. But you know, it's the guys that are rock stars. We're gonna like, find them, and uh, finally we did. Well, stop motion's easy to correct. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how long did that take? Well, that was a guy named Jimmy Picker who won an Academy Award. For this thing called Sunday in New York, which is about Mayor. Um, anyways, the Mayor of New anybody? anybody? Mayor Koch. Brian? Koch. I think he has. Oh, a, a, wait, no. a Koch? Ed Koch. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Anyways, a beautiful <laughs> um, animated thing, and he won the Academy Award for it. So I tracked him down, and he agreed to do this thing. And uh, like, this is funny because that's just a little piece for when the burger first wakes up. <laughs> and the rest is Jimmy just sent it to me. You, know, you just did it, and it was cool, and it's, um, I'm very proud of it. Like, oh, look, it's weird. <laughs> but the little handle used to make him go wiggle, wiggle, but he doesn't wiggle anymore. <laughs> it, it's one of the great scenes from babies comedies. It's, it's an iconic scene. It's so amazing. It, oh, thanks. Well, I'm just so blessed, and I had a really good producer, Andy Meyer, that said, the other thing is crap. You should have the fried rack first. That's the thing. I'm not stuff for it. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the cast for a second. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Curtis Armstrong, who. Yeah. 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 He's my favorite thing going in this. And he, so, at this point, he's done uh, Risky Business and uh, Revenge of the Nerds, right? Yeah. yeah. And. He does this thing where uh, he is a total loser, but he's got more swagger and confidence than anybody going, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and the, his, re his reaction to the, the overlap is like a textbook on how to deal with a bully. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, was all, that was one of the things, I'll say that Curtis just made up right there. Like just, he came in to say that stupid line that John was supposed to be sad and Curtis said, but he thought it was funny the way he said it, so he kept laughing, and then we were like, dude, we're putting that in the movie. And then, yeah, and then we had to write the part where you know, they're dancing, and he comes up again. <laughs> uh, before I forget, because I, I'm spinning out again, I always do, but there's things like um, in, the, in the beginning of the movie with, um, with, with the artwork, she would say, or, or, or the, the, he comes out in the negligee, and the neighbor comes and sees him, you know, he's cutting stuff off. And that was my cameraman, because he had a really he was a funny looking guy. He was an adorable guy. I love it. I don't mean funny looking guy. I mean he was a very cool guy. But he was really funny. Sorry. And so, um, so that just happened on the moment. I mean, that was like the first thing we shot. And so then when the artwork suit came up, I'm like, oh my god, you know, we need another artwork suit. Wouldn't it be great if Izzy comes in the artwork suit? And then I, then I used my, my semi you know, brain that I had, and I'm like, I don't need another suit, I can just cut to him and they can borrow the suit. And they were great. He shows up and they the artwork suit and he gets good laugh. Movie magic. It was great, yeah. Uh, so you, David Ockin Spears is, so if you're, you know, over 50, you, you know he's from MASH, right? Yeah. Did you, were you, uh, was it like, I mean, how did you get him to sign up for this? Because at this point, he's been on MASH for a decade, right? Yeah, he's a very intelligent guy. He's actually he's like, so like a doctor of symphonies and stuff like that. He's a very smart guy. Mm. And um, so I just couldn't believe when he walked in the door. I was like, i got to trap this guy as fast as I can because he's going to figure it out. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny. I think he just wanted to bring a different level of um, his kind of comedy. I think he played kind of, you know, in MASH, he played kind of a stuffy and stuffy yeah. kind of not fun character. And um, I guess he kind of did it in my movie, too. Right? Yeah. Um, what am I saying? Anyway, he was just adorable, and he wanted to do it. I, I think him and Kim Darby connected the mom. You know, yeah. they just, the scene with the goop, like, <laughs> like, we're all under the table there. That, that was the hardest scene I've ever had to get through. I just, they, we all had to giggle. It's really bad. You know, we're running out of time. It's hot. And I just, nobody could stop laughing. People had to leave. I don't know what it was about her, but she just stand there and, and 
I mean, food plays an incredible role in this movie. You, there's obviously the burgers, the, the goop, the sea monster, and the pie. Oh, yeah. yeah. That might have been a bridge too far. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I still see that going. But the snorted jello. Oh, yeah. Is, yeah. So you Based have. Based on a true story. <laughs> you have these great. Uh, Character comedian, the Vincent Schiavelli, oh, right? Yeah. Uh, Taylor Negron, they're both in Fast Times and they're yeah. hilarious in this. And then we got, I want to hear about uh, how, you, so Chuck Mitchell. Oh, yeah. Is, is if you're, is Porky, right? So if, yeah. again, if you're a certain age, and, and, it's, and if, you're, if, you're a, if you're a male, this was like, <laughs> uh, kind of your, your education. Yeah, and, and it's really not that happy with the only I mean, back then it was so good. It had the perfect tone poster, basically. Yes, yeah. So um, here's the thing about Chuck Mitchell. So he was, a, this movie, Porky's, was huge, and it was the, one of like the first two movies. So I was driving, I was living in Los Angeles, and I'm driving along, and I see him, and he's sitting, and there's a cigar shop. And he's got this big pink Cadillac with like, like um, with a, uh, Sorry, what the horns are like some dead animal. And it was awesome. And so I, I was just driving on the sense of before, dreaming of playing day, you know, making a movie and stuff. And I said, you know what? And I would see him every time because he would sit out there. He's all rich now for porkies and he would smoke his cigars and he would sit on his chair. And it was like a celebrity to me, you know, this guy. And I said, if I ever make a movie, I'm going to put Chuck Mitchell in it. <laughs> and that's why I made pork. Then mm. the big bird for him. And, and then I hired him. And he said, yeah. So, and he actually did it. He script. really was really yeah. funny, actually. He, he, he's the one who did that dental plan, you know, when a uh, mm -hmm. He would just add live the stuff that was actually quite, you know, taking out his teeth and stuff. There was stuff that I was, I just sat back and watched and took a lot of credit for, but there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of people did some amazing stuff. I mean, I can't picture him not horrifying. I'm sure he's a nice guy. Oh, yeah, but he, he wouldn't seem intimidating, but he's not. Yeah. He's super nice, but he's, you know, he's not, he's all business. But he brought the comedy. And going back to Curtis, my favorite part of the movie is when Curtis, when, when he said, you may find the helper, and Curtis is Charles <laughs> Demar. <laughs> no one told him to do that. He just did it. <laughs> That's true. And, and the other one I have to Dan Schneider is the balloon, running with the balloon. <laughs> well, when you're sitting there, and you, it says written by, you know, and it's like me, and it, but then Dan does something like that, or like Curtis, it's just a gift, you know. They, they're just all so talented and amazing. <laughs> Really good. One thing I wanted to ask you about, like, one of the, 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 the thought I had, and, and, and get your take on on the Ricky character, because it's he's obviously super creepy now, especially like I mean he was at the time, right? Yeah. But even now it's you know more creepy. Uh, but what's interesting to me is like so Revenge of the Nerds comes out in the year before yours, right? And that movie kind of gives license to these, to these guys because they're marginalized to be horrible to women. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now you look back on Revenge of the Nerds and, and yeah. people are like, oh yeah, that probably wasn't cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, you, but this guy's a creep and he actually is kind of the villain at the end. I mean, yeah. this is who, it, it, it's really, he fights, you know, Lane really fights him, yeah. he's not. Yeah, I thought that might be unique too, is to, to make uh, Ricky Smith sort of the bad guy. So it's not the typical blonde bad guy that's, that's Aaron Dozer or Rock Steel Flex, which is his other name, by the way. And um, so I thought it might be really funny if the really violent, like crazy person that he has to have the legal challenge with is Dan Schneider. You know, he's Ricky Smith. And I think it works great. I love their little sword fight at the end. It's great. <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, in the end, everything you know, comes out pretty happy. Even Ricky gets a girlfriend. <laughs> Mrs. Smith, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you find her? She, she had never been in anything. I don't think so. I, I she just walked in, and how do you say no to that? I, mean, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And, and I had a very different a version of like the Smiths were supposed to be Southern people, um, so it was really strange when she came in and she was like this almost Broadway boisterous you know person, bigger than life. And then when Dan came in, I mean, I saw Ricky as sort of a weasley little creepy person, but Dan came in and he brought the nose, the nose spray, and did that. And so we're like, oh, uh, Dan, nice to meet you. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, are you acting or is that, is that real? 
and he really committed, you know? And then he was like, no, I brought that for a problem and stuff. And I was, I, 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 and he was, but then you see the two of them together, you know, Mrs. Smith and Ricky, you know, Dan and Laura Waterbury, wow. Mm -hmm. it, it was, yeah. I would just say no to that. Right, right. Yeah, perfect. And then Monique, right? So cute. Di Diane Franklin, not French. No, strangely enough, acting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she was in a very famous movie called The Last American Virgin. That she played this mean, mean. As a matter of fact, when most of her movies that I've seen of her, she always played a villain. Mm -hmm. Isn't that strange to think Monique is evil? But um, in The Last American Virgin, she just destroyed. It's another teen movie, and the whole thing is like she tries to help. No, this guy tries to help her and meet a boy. Blah blah blah. And, but he's really in love with her, and she just destroys his heart, like destroys it. So when I was looking for a girl to be the girl that breaks up with him, I kind of went for the obvious with her, and then I decided, wait, you know, maybe she could be the good girl in this. And so it was between her and Amanda, uh, Amanda West, who's fantastic. And so that's how Monique ended up being that character. I mean, I ended up being Monique, because I wanted her to play a good guy for once. So you originally had him flipped? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the right decision. I know! Yeah. <laughs> so many things went right. <laughs> yeah, right? And it's funny, watching the movie, I'm sorry, I could spin up one more thing. There's another thing that, oh, I know this. One thing that always gets kind of a laugh is when uh, Amanda's uh, like, talking about Lane and she's, gonna, you know, and she's got the photo of him and you think for a second she's talking about how cool he is, but it's, you know, she takes it out and throws it in the garbage. Right. And that's because, um, Originally, I had this whole scene, I was setting up this joke, and they, they talked about it a couple times, where John, when he gets, I mean, Lane, when Lane gets uh, nervous, he barbs. And so they, they always say, like, yeah, they buy the guy who had his barb from the toilet, blah, blah, And so I had a scene where they go home, they break up, and you don't really see it. You see them in this window, and the dad's outside painting, I mean, his dad's supposedly the best dad. And you see John, you know, getting upset, and he runs to the window, and you can tell him he barfs on the dad. And it just really wasn't good. And so, <laughs> Again, I've heard it's too far in the thing in the pot that's going there. Um, mm -hmm. And so I had to come up with the fastest way possible, and we were happy to be in this place in Snowbird. It was like the last day of it. So we wrote that little scene of her throwing away that picture, and it works perfectly. But you can tell in the movie that it, it, it's an over um, voiceover when they're driving back from the thing. She's like, I want to go out with somebody better looking and stuff like that. And it seems to work, but you, you used to see her break up with him. And it was just too tragic and then sad. And there's parts involved, which isn't that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel like we gotta ask. You, it, I don't know if there's a story behind it, but we'd be remiss. I, I'd be remiss to not like the the paper boy. And where did that come? From? That is the only part of the movie that is 100 percent true. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny Gasparini, <laughs> paper boy. Uh, I I don't have my idea. You guys know when I was like 15, I didn't have. And so I would get home from school, my mom would with my dad and stuff, we'd get home from school, and the paper boy would knock on the door, and it was John, this guy, Johnny Gasparini, he was our neighbor. And he just had cold eyes. He was just, <laughs> <laughs> I was scared of him. And so um, he would go to say, your mom loves me, you know, whatever, probably was like $7. And so I'm like, well, I'm just a kid. I don't have any money. Well, I'll just wait across the street. You know? <laughs> Why? Why? What are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hopefully I can see when, but it was just one of those things where you just look around and your feet are staring at you. Like, but somebody wants to know Johnny, I can't believe nobody's found Johnny Gaston. Brian, you found Johnny Gaston? Oh, Didn't look for him. This Brian is a, is a trove of information about that outfit. Yeah. You can tell me his outfit. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's awesome. Um, but he's a real guy, but I, I, he's a, I hate to admit I'm a little bit exaggerated, a little bit. <laughs> And, and unlike the uh, uh, Howard Postel, there's no exaggeration there. <laughs> there's a mixture. There's, there's a mixture. I had a cracky Camaro. Um, I, there was a lady that I would always get end up in a lane, and I had, I had a three-speed Camaro. It was like, it was like I, I would call it a 250. It was like, eh, it was like a golf cart. But it looked like it. And I, there was a lady that was like, mm, mm, mm. And, so I originally wrote it as a lady. But then um, I wanted, I, I think I tracked down Yuji Okamoto, um, like I really wanted him to be in the movie and stuff. And so I originally had, so I made at about, I, I was obsessed with um, foreign exchange students. 
Okay. Uh, how did you come up with the name Better Off Dead? Uh, this is so lame. I, I'm a total Elton John freak, and uh, Captain Fantastic came out and had a song called Better Off Dead, so I'm trying to think of Better Off Dead, Better Off Dead. In there, and I just said, you know, that's a great name for a story about a guy who wants to kill himself. <laughs> so, that's it. <laughs> Is that a good answer? <laughs> Jim. Yeah. We need you on the mic for the live stream. So I was saying that uh, one of the things I noticed in the movie for the first time tonight, Amanda, so the character of Beth, when she's walking in with the entourage, her being in Nightmare on Elm Street, I found it funny that the gentleman walking in behind her was wearing a shirt that mirrored the Freddy Krueger sweater. Was that an homage or is that a coincidence? That's a good question, and, the, and it's actually kind of a coincidence. And then it's so interesting that you just asked that because I saw Amanda like um, a, a few months ago at a SCAD uh, in, um, where is it? In, um, Georgia. Georgia. Savannah. Yeah. Savannah. Savannah, Georgia. We had this show with it. It was really fun. And somebody asked Amanda that, and it turns out that we think that the um, costumer worked, might have worked or known something about that and stuff. So, so, because we don't think it was like, we don't know anything about it. Like, we didn't do it, but we think that somebody might have um, done that. You know? and I, we think it might have been our wardrobe people. were really fun, and they would join us. You know, the people who made the artwork, too. They were really funny, and they would do stuff like that just so, and see if we would notice and stuff. So we're gonna, we've decided, Amanda Wiss and I decided we're going to blame it on the wardrobe people. <laughs> but it, it is weird and cool. I mean, I like it. Oh, no, I'm over here. Okay. They've already given me the mic. It's too late. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan. I love the Sabrina animated series. It was very cool with like, your hair. Um, so I saw this movie when I was a kid, and I remember the scene where the food crawls off the plate, and I remember the scene where the mom, like, kind of accidentally, like, commits, like, helps him commit suicide, and it's kind of a crazy moment. And I was just wondering, these things have, like, stayed with me 20, 30 years when I talk to my friends about it. They love it, too. What do you think makes them timeless and irreverent? Wow, um, thank you so much. That's really, you're the one who watched my Sabrina show. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for doing that. Um, I think my gut just says that it's just good, like timeless, dumb jokes, like just comedy. It's just comedy, it's like if somebody gets hurt or falls, um, you know, I think that's it. Uh, there was this movie, 10, I don't know if anybody ever saw this movie with, um, with um, Dudley Moore. And it was like he, in the movie, he kept falling off a cliff, and he kept falling an abnormally long time. And so I stole that because I still think about that. I love it. And so I stole that for John when he's crashing in the in with the paper before he goes off the cliff, just weirdly long, you know. <laughs> and, and actually, cut out about a minute. <laughs> I really did. I had oh, I just had this really long like, sick. He bounced off the rocks. <laughs> Test screenings and things. <laughs> but um, I think that's just it. The jokes that, that still work. Like, that, it's just so neat. I don't really have an explanation for it. <coughs> I think they don't, really, they, they don't need a time or place. Uh, like, I look at the wardrobe on these people, and as I was telling Brian earlier, to, you know, it looks so 80s when they're at the dance and stuff. But at the time, we, did, we couldn't afford to wardrobe the, the background people. So they were told to come what you would wear to, like, a dance. Yeah. And that's what they wore. They all looked like Boy Jordan or whatever and stuff. <laughs> really? Because you know, we were easy. Yeah, yeah. We were yeah. like, with eyes on it. That was not what my, my uh, middle school dance was no. like. No. It was like Benetton. But I think you probably used to be LA, LA at the time. Yeah. More. yeah. They were comfortable doing that. But I love that. The background artists were fantastic. And that's what they showed up with. And it's, it's one of the things that makes it, um, you can tell it, it's a time frame. But the jokes, I, I don't think, most of them, that um, they need a time frame. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got one over here, Brian. Thanks so much. Uh, just a random question. We were looking at the um, coffee mug that Lane had that said Larry. <laughs> was, that a, was that a missing sibling off a cut? Oh, yes. <laughs> or, or someone just didn't make the cut? Or a no, no, we just, we just went over this. It's so funny. That, that, a couple people have asked this, and Brian asked it, and um, here's what it is. I had this really funny prop guy. His right. name's Art Lip Schultz, and he's fantastic, and he's the best. And remember, I had had, like I said, like people in college that did all the 
I'd say four people were on my film crew. So I never knew, a, you know, to have a prop guy that had a truck full of stuff. I mean, it was so neat. And people that would lift lights and do things, and they'd hammer people. So the prop guy, Art, he had everything. Like, I, I could just say almost anything to the guy and come up with some really dumb idea, and he would say, yeah, I got that in my truck. <laughs> I, think, I think prop people are, like, harder, you know? <laughs> they, they, like, have all their stuff, and then they move it to some either a van or whatever, and they use it for other movies and stuff, and they just happen to have everything. And so, with the coffee mug, I think he got together with Cusack and just decided that John's so lame that he doesn't even have his own coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's where that landed, because that just sounds like something that Art would do with John, and someday, hopefully, you'll be able to ask John about that. That's my take on that. That one over here? All right, hey, Sam, it's Steve. Uh, seeing the movie tonight took me right back to uh, first seeing it. Uh, but your inspiration behind making it, really, it's a ski movie. Um, and we're all Connecticut, we love our local mountains, Mount Southington, Woodbury. Uh, anyways, but uh, what is, is there a K-12 and your inspiration behind the ski movie? Uh, I, the only thing I ever learned in college was, I mean, in high school, was that there was a K-2, right? It's the giant thing I, I, I'm, I'm like a hot tub, I don't ski. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's the highest point on earth, it's called the K2. I could be wrong, but I, you know, I make up all this stuff anyway. But um, so I assumed it was. Wow, maybe I'm wrong. After all these years, I've got to change the movie. But, so I thought, well, it's the K, you know, the K2's back. Think how cool and scary the K12 would be. <laughs> so I just added 10 digits to it. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, was there, does anybody know if there's a Mount Brody? Yeah. Yes. There was. Brody Is it gone now? Yes, it's gone. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I made Brody Mountain because of that, uh, where we used to ski. Like <laughs> where was that? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> Big Birch is still in business. Oh, yeah. And Hunter. Yeah. And Hunter, right. Even there. We also had white tablecloth for prom dinner at Remember with candelabra and extra courtesy See? Tables? Yeah. We did that. Right? Well, see, Tyler's remembering it. This is <laughs> the bottom of this. <laughs> with this microphone, I uh, almost feel like uh, the movie Wall Street, uh, Michael Douglas said, Greed is good. <laughs> <laughs> it clarifies, cuts the chase. <laughs> but I'm Stuart Kai. Oh, hi, Stuart. How are you? I used to copy your homework. Yes, <laughs> 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 Western Junior High. Yeah. 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 Penciling uh, Mickey Mouse on a notebook in a sequence so that if you uh, flip the pages, you could see Mickey Mouse uh, walking across the page, which I, I still remember to this day. This is why uh, I had to copy your homework. The math uh, question, my twin brother Craig uh, actually reminded me that he, uh, Craig would come to my room at night and we had this uh, uh, ninth grade or tenth grade math book. And uh, for us in Mr. Miller's class, it was just uh, an exercise. But for Craig and Steve, that was their test. And so Craig would always come in my room, like, brother, do you have the time at homework? He never told me that they were his tests until <laughs> so he was leaving. Uh, but uh, uh, you'll have to remember that uh, Charles Damar is featured in this film, who was uh, Steve's best friend. Yeah. And he was quite artistic. He passed away. Uh, but he uh, uh, was uh, an early inspiration. I still have a yearbook where, in Earth Science, they grade uh, Charlie. Uh, was penciling some uh, Star Trek characters and then signing Steve Holland because you didn't make your artwork. Uh, and uh, I'm just surprised that there was no Mr. O'Brien in the yearbook in my grade in this movie because yeah. I, that, that's uh, a whole other story. But we, we, uh, he was a great teacher. Yeah, so right? there's material for oh, for yeah. years yeah. Uh, from he last year. He gave me great for John Allen. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I've never done Elton Allen because he's such an yeah. inspiration. Yeah. Well, one of these days you don't cross your path. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to give this over to uh, Chris Tell, another Greenwich High person. Yeah, great seeing you, Stuart. Thank you, guys. And thank you for your
<laughs> we have a question from the live stream real quick here. Oh, sure. From Mark. Yes. I hope this makes sense, Mark. Is, is that the live stream? Is there a yeah. there? Yeah, that's the live stream. There's another camera back there. So, what's the deal with the guy holding the fork in the cafeteria behind <laughs> John Cusack when he tries to ask how Chris... Yep, that's a great question, and I, I, I have an answer for that. Um, <laughs> that was the guy who, let, who gave us the money, $3 million, to make that outfit. That was his son. And, oh. and he's really a nice guy, and the guy... Um, I'm just going to space it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is the worst time to use but... Um, they were a company called CBS Theatrical Films, and dang it. Anyway, so this guy, he, he was kind of working in this kind of learning stuff, and I wrote a little scene for him where John um, flipped some food on him or something like that. Like, I, they had their little moment, but it didn't kind of make the cut. So it is weird that you just stand there like that with, with potatoes on it. But it was something that, that happened, and it always drives me nuts. Cause, oh, no, well, anyway. Yes, that's all it is. Um, I just feel like I should be more reverential to this guy who invested all his money in me. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't the one who gave the money. No, no, he was the president of the company and <coughs> his son, but I do, I'm so grateful to them and they were so great. So I thought I gave this guy a little, a little you know, bit in the movie. Uh, it didn't really work out, so then John randomly is talking to a guy with potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Sam, I have a question for you. Of course, Hi, again. Um, in terms of physical media releases, right? I've seen much less popular films, much less beloved films get uh, physical media releases with all the bells and whistles, yeah. commentary, deleted scenes, featurettes, <laughs> and I'm just wondering, you know, why, why is there an industry reason why you haven't been approached to help produce a commemorative? 40th anniversary special edition of Better Off Dead with the well, commentary learned, and yeah, all that. We've learned that no comedy celebrities liked me or have said, you know, how much they love this movie. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, here's the thing. I, I think what I learned about Better Off Dead is that it, the company that made it went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So what happens is then they have a library and then the library gets bit up beaten up by some other company. And when it's a little movie like mine, I think it's actually a public domain now. I actually think nobody owns Better Off Dead right now. Really? Um, and if you didn't know this, Stuart, uh, Mickey Mouse is now public domain. <laughs> so I, I could have gotten sued when I was doing that. Right. Uh, but now, so things after a certain amount of time. Yeah. But in my case, I think that Better Off Dead went through a series of studios that um, didn't, you know, do anything with it, and I know there's one Blu-ray, I think, but that's about as far as it went. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's kind of sad, but I, you know, I wish someone would say, hey, it's that, let's find you and try to make a show about it, but, you know, it's not going to happen. Okay. But this is great! <laughs> <laughs> Badger. Badger. Okay. Badger. Well, Badger was a neighbor. We have a neighbor named Badger. We love the name. It's great. Um, but Badger is based on my brother, who should stand up. There he is. My brother, Jeff, is actually Badger. When I was growing up, Jeff could do anything. He still can't. He could just fix anything. I'm copying Stuart's homework. My brother was doing like algebra and stuff, and he's just doing amazing things. And he still does. And it was just always like, you know, if I sent away for something in the back of a comic book, it would just be crap. It'd be an X-ray specs, you know. And my brother would you know, get a submarine and he made a submarine. So um, I just thought it would be cuter to have a little kid be that precocious little guy instead of my brother. Not that you're not adorable, Jess, but, you know. <laughs> but that's uh, the story about him. Did that answer the question? Yeah. I thought it was a trick question. <laughs> Jeff, did you tell him to ask that? <laughs> Rip. Rip. No. Uh, Ryan. Thank you. Uh -oh. Here come the big guns. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So 24 years old, no credits to speak of for features, right? You have the keys to the kingdom handed to you. 
What were some of the most memorable bits of adversity you faced during production, and how did you handle them? Um, gosh, you know, it's funny, because that question, it, and something that you asked me the other day, like, what would I change after 40 years or something? I did think of some other things, by the way, which I'll try to remember later if we're not all asleep listening to me. But um, what was, what, what I have to admit is, this was the most wonderful time of my life. And if not my life, I'm not saying because I'm married and I have beautiful children. Sure. <laughs> sure. My wife's on the ride the live stream now. Going, Why are you? Um, <laughs> but um, it was so wonderful that it couldn't have been any better. And and um, I remember like there's a scene where uh, Ricky and they leave the dance and you see John. John goes like this because it started to rain. Like and we, it was our last night. That was our last shot in Los Angeles. And I remember going. I never even thought of rain. Like, what would we have done? You know, it's like the weather was great. I just realized we never rain. Mm, wow, so I, I had no problems, none. Everybody who supported me were wonderful. The cast, the crew, couldn't have given it. It was just the ultimate dream come true. It really was. Um, my own failings were maybe the only problems of things I, you know, I think I told you yesterday I shot a bunch of stuff. Um, it's sad that you know you, you have a film crew running around Los Angeles trying to do something where you could use the time better if you cut it out. You know, yeah. I had a whole thing, a whole stream of um, Kim Darby, the mom. She was in a cult, and John's telling Monique about that. And it was the cult of Gumby, and she was at the airport handing out pamphlets where the Gumby had other Gumbies, and it was like, why did we go to an LAX? You know, to shoot her in a Gumby suit. So. Things like that, I would say. I would say my own screw ups were the only thing that were a problem. Okay. Everybody else were wonderful and made it perfect. Okay. Hi. Got a question from the paper boy. Oh yeah, he was great. Yeah. Why do you go by Savage Steve? I killed a paper boy when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> We don't like to talk about it. I'll see y'all back. <laughs> Go ahead. Steve, echoing what everyone has said, what a fantastic movie. Great to see you on the big screen tonight. Really just brings back memories. Um, equally iconic, I think, is the soundtrack of this movie. I, really, everyone gets into it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious how much of, the, of your influence, I know in, in movies there's people who do the choosing of that, but how much of it is your influence? And just as an aside, was there a licensing issue with this soundtrack? Because it was always very hard to find. You'd go to like, pre-internet, you'd go to Sam Goody, and you'd say, I need the, I need the, the, the soundtrack. they go for, for better off what? They didn't know, know the movie. Yeah. And now it's very scarce to get, and as you may have seen online, very expensive to obtain a hard mm -hmm. copy of the soundtrack. So I'm just curious, again, your influences and if there was any licensing. Well, here's the thing. With a movie, you do a temp track. So everything was um, temped out. I think I was using a lot of the music from To Live and Die in L.A., which had this really cool Wang Chung, like, dun, 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 like when they were skiing and stuff. But it was A&M Records, and they were the company that had, they just did The Breakfast Club and stuff. And they were learning, like, the MTV generation, like, putting in music that was original music. And I didn't know who Rupert Hine was or any, basically Howard Jones or anybody that did it. Uh, that did the soundtrack, and I had had my temporary stuff, and it's really hard to, to let go. And of course, there's John Williams everywhere for like um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, for temp, for the ski chases and stuff, and so stuff you could never use. So then when I met Rupert Hine, he was so cool, and um, I have to admit, and I've talked to Brian about this, the one thing that, that I wasn't sure about it was I really wanted this kind of score to be kind of like a, a symphonic score, like a real life old school, like, you know, John Williams, he thing. And so I, I struggled with like what Rupert was doing. He kind of made it a techno, you know, boom, boom, boom. I, I can't explain it, but it was an 80s techno thing that we've all come to love. And so, and so I kind of let that go because I, I don't know a lot about life. And so they told me at a and Records, this is cool, and this, these are the guys. And I went with it, and I'm really proud of it. I mean, that, that they talked me into it and said, don't go for the John Williams, try this. And I, it's really unique, and I really like it. I don't really know about the business end at all, as far as like why you can't get stuff or anything like that. I think it goes back to the, the company being bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, that's my only thing I can think of, but although I think it's on a and I don't really understand that either. I don't know. 
But, I mean, right now, if, if you made your movie now with Sinatra, Muddy Waters, Hendrix, Paul Simon, oh, God. the publishing rights would be the yeah. same as your budget. Your exactly, budget. That, that's the other miracle of it all. I was like, did you do Jimi Hendrix? I mean, I just looked at it. Wow, it's really cool. You can't do that anymore, and you can't have products anymore. You know, it's like when you take some Captain Crunch or the Flintstones or things. You know, those those days are over. You know, so I was really yeah. lucky. And I, again, I think it was just having a brand new company, A and M Records, uh, turning to, into an A and M Films company. They just no one knew what they were doing. It was kind of like the Wild Wild West. It's for teen movies and stuff. Squid, are you bored? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and um, so I think that's the answer. I, I don't. I don't know if that's an answer. The radio bit where, where you know, he turns, it, this has become a, a trope that I feel like you were the first one who did this. The person, something bad's going on, yeah. the, the radio's mocking him, like, almost famous does it, like, you know, I mean, uh, sorry, Jerry Maguire does it, like, six years later. Like, you've seen this a million times. I don't think he'd seen it prior to you. Yeah, but it's, I mean, hasn't that ever happened to all of us? I mean, that's like, mm -hmm. I swear, man. First day and some song that you hate or that, that makes you feel terrible. You know? yeah. You're bloated, la la la. <laughs> and so, 